So thank you, Glenn, for joining us tonight. And thank you to everybody else that has um, signed on this evening. Um, Glenn, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you do what you do best. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Oops. I didn't... I need to share my screen first, don't I? Mm -hmm. I think I want to do this one. Nice try. Whenever Franklin caught the ball. Okay, I will mute everybody as well. Okay, so everybody should see my title slide in full screen mode. Is that right? It's not going to flip, but you know, you have to go into settings and do something. We can see your slides. Okay. So, and just the title slide, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, just the title slide. Yes. Okay, there are people speaking, and uh, I'm not quite there to mute everybody. Would you please mute your microphones? Please, everybody, put yourselves on mute. Okay. Take it away, please, Glenn. Okay. Ah, this is so. Megan is my my son Andrew's girlfriend, so you could admit admit Megan. And oh, okay. That'll be perfect. Great. Good. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's very humbling to have this many people. Uh, on the call. Uh, as I said to Andrea earlier, I don't think it's me. I think it's the fact that it's a cultural desert on TV tonight and everybody's <laughs> not watching the Leafs and decided to watch me instead. So um, anyway, nonetheless, I'm glad you're here. Um, so I, I've entitled this talk Simple and Straight. And what I'm going to be talking about is the setup and delivery fundamentals for the no lift flat foot delivery. Um, so if you aren't familiar with myself, um, originally I'm from Regina. I've been a coach for 21 years at various levels. Um, I'm now a consulting coach for the Ontario Curling Council. My, my specialty is brushing, um, but this talk is not about brushing. Um, I'm also a development coach for Wilfrid Laurier, hence the, uh, the Laurier shirt. And my email address is glennpolly at gmail.com. And you can find me on Twitter at gpolly. So here's a little bit more in depth about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to start with some opening remarks. But what I'm mostly going to cover in two uh, Glenn, I think I muted you. Would you unmute yourself, please? I muted all, which is included you. There. Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so after some opening remarks, I'm, I'm gonna be covering um, the content of the talk in two parts. I'm first gonna be talking about the fundamentals of the no lift uh, flat foot delivery. And then in the second part, which is gonna be a little shorter, I'm going to talk about two uh, frequently occurring problems with the flat foot delivery from what I see uh, out there, and that's the drift and the fishtail. And I'll talk about um, diagnosing the problems and how to correct them. So first, some opening remarks. So my motivation for this talk stems from the fact that this past year, I was coaching two U18 teams, and it's and it's been a while since I coached at the U18 level, so it was a little bit of a new, newer experience for me. Um, and what struck me as I was coaching at these different events was the lack of attention paid to delivery fundamentals by many of the teams um, that I watched playing. And it didn't matter where I saw them, whether I saw them play in Barrie or Toronto or in Kitchener-Waterloo, or for that matter, seeing them in Saskatchewan or seeing them at the um, Mark Kennedy Junior Classic in Alberta. 
Um, across the board, I was I bore witness to lots of teams that were clearly struggling with shot making because they weren't paying enough attention to the fundamentals. And so I thought that it would be a really good idea if someone, perhaps me, um, actually gave a, a talk about the fundamentals of the curling delivery and what it is that we should expect um, from our athletes. And in particular, athletes at younger ages. And so my uh, one of the focuses of my talk is going to be about coaching younger athletes, whether they be U8, U15s or U18s or U21s. Um, my second opening remark, though, is that while there is a, I think, well understood set of delivery fundamentals um, that has been published by Curling Canada and used in courses for a very long time, um, we still have to coach the athlete that's in front of us. And, you know, this is true of of all sports. So we we take for granted, I think, today that when an athlete plays hockey or baseball, um, uh, that the equipment is is altered to some extent in order to suit the physiology of the athlete. So in hockey, for example, sticks have different lengths, blades have different lies shafts have different um, uh, flex, all to suit, you know, the particular physiology of that individual player. In baseball, some bats are shorter, some bats are longer, some bats have a slightly wider diameter than, than another. Again, all of this to suit the player, but there are standards in which everybody has to work within. And then perhaps the best example is golf, and we take for granted in golf that you know you're not you're not going to have an optimal performance on the golf course if you simply pick up somebody else's clubs and start using them the clubs have to fit the player so again there are standards that have to be met across the board for all players which are established by the PGA but some shafts are steel and stiffer for higher swing velocities and other shafts can be of carbon fiber or fiberglass for players who don't swing the club quite so hard. Grips are different sizes to fit different hands. Um, clubs can be cut down when, when athletes are, are shorter than the, the average for which the standard shafts are made. All kinds of allowances are made. So, so we take for granted in different sports that because athlete physiology is different, then the equipment should suit them. It's no different in curling. The issue, however, is that in the curling delivery, there isn't a lot of equipment. There's only the broom. But nonetheless, there are differences in physiology. And because there are differences in physiology, our coaching has to be applicable to the particular athlete that we're dealing with. And so I'm going to make a couple of remarks through the talk um, as I go through that. And I'll illustrate some of the differences from the athletes that I've recently been working with over the last couple of years. So you can see those kinds of differences and what those differences mean. Okay. So back to, back to the basics, the no lift flat foot curling de delivery. So the goals from, for going to this delivery and this is not how I started delivering the stone. I'm old. I started with a lift delivery. Uh, I still did a flat foot slide, but I started curling using corn brooms. So I've been around for a while. Um, but the goals of the no lift flat foot delivery are to minimize any lateral movement of the stone from the line of delivery, minimize the lateral distance required for the athlete and the stone's line of delivery to converge, as opposed to a lift delivery where the stone is lifted right on center line. It permits younger athletes to throw accurately without having to lift the rock. It simplifies the delivery movement as much as possible to reduce opportunities for misalignment of, of the body. And it minimizes the differences required for throwing from one side of the sheet to the other. So all of these are good goals, which is why uh, for Curling Canada, this is the delivery now that's that's taught. Okay. 
So with that, let's talk now about the setup. How do we set up in the delivery? And the first thing I wanna mention is the hack. So here's a picture of a Marco hack with the correct dimensions uh, taken in my kitchen the other night, um, developed by a Quebec athlete, Marco Ferraro in the 1980s, became official in 89. It's used in almost all Canadian curling clubs today. Um, and it's designed to fit over a standard two by four. Uh, and this is the, the typical hack that every player is going to use. So it's similar in purpose to blocks in track and field, but the important difference with the Marco hack is that the surface of the hack where the foot rests is actually concave. And the reason for that is to accommodate a slightly, and I do mean slightly, angled foot depending on where exactly on the sheet the target broom is. So if the target broom is on the right side of the sheet, then the athlete might place their foot perhaps half a centimeter more to the left of the hack in order to say, utilize that concave surface to their advantage when they're going to the right. And conversely, if the, the broom is on the extreme left side of the sheet, then they might move their hack foot half a centimeter slightly to the right, again, utilizing that concave um, surface of the hack in order to get a better grip with their hack foot on the hack to push themselves forward. But it's a, it's a very small difference. Nonetheless, the hacks are concave. So in the no lift delivery, what we want for a hack foot position is the ball of the hack foot on the back of the hack. So here's an example from one of the athletes, Amanda, who I coached this last this past season. You'll note that no portion of her curling shoe is actually on the bottom plate. If it was, then what would happen is if she, as she moved forward, she would lose contact with the back of the hack much more quickly. And if you think about this from a track and field standpoint, it would be like somebody on the track putting the heel of their of their foot onto the block and the ball or their toe onto the track itself. And as soon as they started forward, they would instantaneously lose any contact with the block and they would be digging their toe into the, into the surface of the track in order to try to get any traction. So we don't want that to happen. Hence the foot is higher. So for the hack foot position, what we want is the, the hack foot ankle and femur of the hack leg all pointing directly at the target. So in this case, this is my son, Ryan, and um, his hack foot, hack leg, and everything about his upper body is going directly towards the target, which in this case is the orange pylon that I've, I've placed on the near hog line. And you'll notice here that there is no twist in the ankle. The foot is pointing directly at the target, okay? So it's easiest to place the foot in that position when you're standing behind the hack before you actually get into the squat position so that you can point your foot at the target broom, which of course means that the target broom has to be set by the skip before you actually start your, your, uh, uh, your setup uh, position. And then once you're squatted down in the hack, you're going to have something like a 50-50 or 60-40 weight distribution perhaps with the hack foot having slightly more weight than the slide foot. Um, I've, I've heard two schools of thought about that particular weight distribution. Um, I believe Curling Canada has it as 50-50. Bill Shearhart likes 60-40, but it's going to be somewhere fairly even between the two feet when you're squatted in the hack. For the position of the brush, the brush has to be positioned in the setup so that when the athlete comes out during the slide, that the hand height of the broom hand is going to be approximately the hand height um, holding the stone. And that's to make sure that the shoulders are level and also that the hand is in such a position that the shoulders are square to the target. So, I mentioned, I mentioned in, the, in my opening remarks that you have to coach the athlete in front of you. And in this particular case, people come in all shapes and sizes, different arm lengths, different leg lengths. And so sometimes this requires a little bit of adjustment 
in order to make sure that the athlete has the grip of the broom in the right position so that when they're sliding, they can look like um, the athlete here. And this is Emma McKenzie, who I've coached for a long time uh, in here in Wilfrid Laurier colors. Okay, slide foot position. So if you take a look at the Curling Canada documentation, um, or if you listen to, uh, just to take an example, Bill, Bill Sherhart's latest podcast about, about the delivery, um, Bill indicates that the slide foot should be heel toe to the hack foot. So in the top right corner, that's my son, Ryan. And you'll notice that his slide foot, which is his left foot, is indeed heel toe to the foot, his right foot that's, that's in the hack. But I offer three other photographs here of different athletes that I've coached this season. And all of these athletes are putting their slide foot in exactly the right place for them. But you'll notice with none of them, they actually match my son, Ryan. So on the left, we've got Amanda, and you'll notice that her heel just slightly overlaps with her toe. In the middle, we've got Riley, whose slide foot is a little bit further up than her toe. And then on the right-hand side, you've got Jessica, um, and Jessica has her slide foot quite a, quite a considerable distance uh, in front of her hack weight toe. But all of these athletes are set up in the right position. So why is that? Well, the issue is, is that the precise position of the slide foot has to match the athlete. And in particular, it has to match the physiology of the athlete the length of their legs, the length of their feet. Um, um, and the width of their hips as well. So um, usually the slide foot is slightly towed out um, when they're in the hack, but the actual precise position of the slide foot can change depending on the athlete that you're coaching. So um, here we've got Riley and Riley is, uh, Riley just turned 17 and is quite tiny. Um, Riley might be five foot one, maybe five foot two if she was wearing heels. In contrast to Riley, here in the upper right-hand corner, I've got uh, Ontario Curling Council's, uh, one of their, one of the, counselors for the OCC, Trevor Bonneau, and his mixed doubles partner, OE Semwan. And uh, Trevor is quite easily the largest individual I have ever worked with on the ice. Uh, Trevor is a very big person. Um, so here he's standing next to OE Sem, and OE Sem is not a small female. She is quite tall for uh, a female athlete herself. Um, but Trevor simply towers over her and cer certainly towers over me. Um, so the slide foot position for Trevor and OSM and for Riley are simply going to be different because they're very different people with very different physiology. So how does one decide where then should the slide foot go? Oops, went too far. So where we want the slide foot is we want the slide foot in a position such that in the setup, in the full squat, the hips are square to the line of delivery in both the X and Y dimension. So the left and the right hip are square forwards and backwards and they're level up and down. We want, we want all of that to be square when they're in the hack. We also want the spine to be vertical. So in the bottom picture here on the left, here I'm standing behind Emma and I've got a broom in my hand, um, which is straight up illustrating, illustrating um, complete vertical. And so she's, her back is straight. And we want the slide leg parallel to the hack leg. So if the hack leg is pointing at the target, then we want the slide leg 
to be parallel to the hack leg, because what we're going to do with the slide foot movement is we're going to move the slide foot back on the line of delivery, and then we're going to move it forward in a straight line, also on the line of delivery, or in fact, parallel to the line of delivery. So one of the things I want to mention here is when you're working with an athlete, and I've worked with a lot of athletes over, over 20 years of coaching, um, don't be afraid to ask your athletes if they have any orthopedic issues. So I'll tell you briefly just a little story. I was working with a team, this is a couple of years ago in Toronto, and they had asked me to come out and work on, um, apparently the team had issues with releases. And I came out there and, and of course their issues were completely different than what they thought it was. The issues were with their setup and their releases were, were problematic because they were trying to fix their deliveries by throwing the stone in various ways. And I was working with this athlete for about 15 minutes trying to move her slide foot in the right position so that her hips were square. And finally, after you know trying a whole bunch of things and not really getting very far, then she looked at me and I could see some tears welling up in her eyes. And she blurted out the fact that she wore orthotics and one of her legs was an inch longer than the other one. And I felt just absolutely horrible after, after hearing that. And I've never forgot that lesson. So when you're working with an athlete and you're striving for, you know, the, the best possible setup position that you can have for an athlete, don't be afraid to ask for your athlete, whether or not they have any orthopedic issues or any information that you can glean to make sure that you don't make the mistake that I made. Okay, so one of the things that I've seen this year coaching U18s is all too often I see athletes make the mistake of putting their slide foot in the wrong position. So this is going to be now your opportunity to do a a a uh, a live present or our live part of the presentation with me. Um, so unless there's an orthopedic issue, then an athlete should be able to perform a full squat with the feet shoulder width apart and the feet flat on the ice. So for all of you out there who are listening, who are able, I'd like all of you now to stand up. I'll wait. Some of you might want to <clears throat> lean against a wall. Some of you might want to grab the end of a back end of a chair. If you have good balance, you might be able to just do it on the floor in front of your computer. That's perfectly fine. However it is that you want to do it. But I, what I want you to do is I want you to position yourselves with your feet flat on the floor, feet shoulder width apart, and do a full squat like Evie Fortier is doing here um, in the picture on the slide. Uh, Evie, a former uh, Wilfrid Laurier athlete. So go ahead and do that. And when you're, I'll, I'll wait until you're done. Do we have to hold it or can we just no you can just get you can go down and then you come back up again but oh, okay the only thing i'm <laughs> the only thing i want you to uh, want you to feel is that when you're in that position if you if you can in fact do a full squat that it's relatively easy to do okay okay so we're going to move on next exercise so now what I've got Evie doing is I've got Evie doing very similar motion, but this time her feet are together. So once again, she's going to do a full squat all the way down and then come back up again. And this is still relatively easy. Um, and I'd like everybody to do that. So you can stand back up again if you've sat back down, grab onto the back of a chair or lean against the wall or whatever it is that you have to do. Put your feet together and then do a full squat all the way down as if you were in the hack and come back up again and your weight's going to be balanced 50 50 on both feet and that should be fairly doable for most of you again unless you have you know a physical issue with your legs or an orthopedic issue or something okay so i'll wait okay everybody done that Okay, so here's the third exercise. Not going to show the slide yet. 
Here's the third exercise. Now, instead of having your feet together, I want you to have them just a couple of inches apart as if you were squatting in the hack. But now this time, before you start your squat, I want you to raise the heel of whatever hack foot you use when you curl. So if you're, if you're right-handed, you're gonna raise your, um, you're gonna raise your right foot. And if you're left-handed, you're gonna raise your left heel. And then once you've got that heel raised, so your other foot's gonna be flat, one heel is gonna be raised. And now I want you to do exactly the same squat motion, all the way down and then all the way back. I'll wait. Okay, I'm going to guess that at least some of you found that last attempt particularly challenging because what's going to happen if you're in that position is you're going to look like Evie here. If your feet are relatively close together and parallel, but one heel is raised, when you squat, your hips are likely going to twist unless you're extremely flexible. With some people, the hips twist to the left. With other people, like Evie here, the hips twist to the right. But regardless, if your hips are twisted and you're in the hack, you're no longer set up on the line of delivery. Because your legs are twisted, if you start a forward motion with your legs in that position, you are not going to hit the broom. And this is one of the things that I see with many. U15 and U18 players, and I saw it very frequently um, this past season. So if you found it challenging, and I'm pretty sure that most of you did, because Evie, Evie in this particular case, I remember when I was photographing her in this position, she almost fell over and Evie was a very good athlete. Um, now what I want you to do is do exactly the same experiment. So your feet are going to be your feet are going to be one foot flat on the floor and the other one your heel is going to be raised. But now what I want you to do is for your foot that's flat, I want you to move it forwards so that you're approximating that classic heel toe position that Curling Canada talks about in the setup for the delivery. So if you move that if you move your slide foot essentially forward, and now you're in a heel toe position with your other foot with the heel raised, and now do the squat, those of you who try it should all feel that that is considerably easier. So go ahead and try that, and I'll wait. And Andrea, would you mind unmuting everybody? I will do that. So for anyone who did that, does anyone want to volunteer what they discovered? I think everybody has to unmute themselves, I believe. I'm just looking here, sorry. So, oh, please unmute. I twist to the right when my feet were not were together. And much easier when my foot was heel to toe. Same. Oh, pa, you are muted. Don't try these exercises with blue jeans on. 
<laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I didn't realize I was muted. Yeah, you're oh. gonna you're gonna see a picture of Ryan right away where Ryan also twists to the left just like I do. Yeah. So, Glenn, are so, we like I said, most people when they do this experiment, unless <laughs> they're really flexible, are gonna twist their hips one way or the other. But nonetheless, this is something that I I see very frequently amongst U15, U18, and U21 teams, that the athletes will get into the hack and their feet will be side by side. And when they squat, their hips will twist. And of course, if their hips twist, that's something that they have to try uh -huh. to fix when they start their full movement. <laughs> Okay, Andrea, can you go back to muting everybody again? Yep, I will do. And you, you will have to unmute yourself, Glenn. Got it. Okay. We can hear you. Great. So um, I wanted everybody to try that because here's the thing. When we start teaching kids how to curl when they're, excuse me, eight years old or nine years old, they're really flexible. So to some extent, it doesn't matter. And it's not something that we really coach to kids a lot when they're little rockers about exactly where to put their slide foot. And because they're so flexible, they can still maintain a balanced delivery and have their slide foot leg parallel to their hack foot leg, even if they're not starting from that heel toe position. And, but as athletes get older, then that flexibility tends to wane. And so you, what happens is like, I had one experience this year where I had an athlete say to me after, after wanting her to correct her slide foot position, she said to me, why are you making me do that? I've, 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 I've slid this way. I've delivered a stone this way for nine years now. And of course the issue is, is that when she started, she was almost certainly more flexible than now as a 17 year old. And she, with, with, now that lack of flexibility, exactly where she puts her slide foot is important and it has to suit her physiology. Okay. So if we put the, place the slide foot in the right position for each particular athlete to make sure that the hack leg points to the target, the slide leg is parallel to the hack leg and the hips are square and level, that's the perfect setup for that athlete. And that mitigates all of the other issues that can stem from the, from the setup um, after that. So like I said, in, in what I've seen in the past year from younger athletes, two frequent problems. One is, a cavalier placement of the hack foot in the hack. The hack foot's not actually pointing at the target. And second is a cavalier placement of the slide foot um, in the proper position for that athlete so that it approximates a heel toe position. And with either of those two problems, then the hips are misaligned and they're gonna have delivery issues that they're gonna have to fix um, going forward. So here I've got my son, Ryan, with two examples. So in the near right example, Ryan's got, I've made Ryan get into the hack with his right ankle twisted. So again, something I see fairly commonly from U18, especially U18 girls. And if you twist your ankle like that, then what's gonna happen is your, uh, if you're right-handed, your hack leg is gonna go uh, to the right of the intended target. And that's where you're going to slide unless you fix it. Um, and then in the other picture, Ryan's put his slide foot right next to the hack foot. And you can see that Ryan's hips are twisted to the left. And because they're twisted to the left, then he's gonna slide to the left of the target. Okay. So what do we want? We, what we want is we want something that's really simple and everything is aligned. So what I call simple and straight. So the setup, should for each athlete, the setup should permit a slide with the body square to the line of delivery and the hips are square to that line. And once, once they're in that position, 
there's minimal extraneous movements that are required in order to make sure that they slide on the line of delivery. So there's fewer misalignments to fix. And every throw can be thrown with a directional tolerance that we can mitigate through brushing. Not asking for everybody to be perfect. We're not robots. Our athletes aren't robots. But if our setup is as good as we can make it, then every throw is going to be close enough that we can make the shot with the appropriate amount of brushing. Okay. Okay. Does stone position matter? And it absolutely does. And this is, again, another thing that I've seen um, uh, as problematic with lots and lots of U15 and U18 athletes and predominantly girls. So here is uh, Rachel demonstrating two different rock positions. Um, one that's a little bit more in front of her body, uh, that's the left-hand one, and one a little more that's um, underneath her armpit, and that's the right-hand shot. Okay, so um, in curling, in the sport of curling, curling is a right-handed, right-dominated sport by a mile. So here I've got five pictures of athletes that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, got Barb Spencer and Ross Patterson on the bottom, and we've got Brad Jacobs, Glenn Howard, and um, Tanner Horgan on the top. And they're all throwing from that position. And as you can see, for all of those players, the stone is underneath their right eye when they're throwing. And that's the classic right-handed delivery. The problem is not everybody is right-handed and not everybody sees the world out of their right eye. So about 90% of the world's population is right-handed, 10% are left, but only 70% of the population are right-eye dominant, 29% are left-eye dominant. And I am one of those people who is strongly left-eye dominant. And because I'm left-eye dominant, um, I see the world differently than a right-eye dominant person. And that really matters in sport. It matters in playing snooker. It matters in throwing darts. And it certainly matters on the curling ice. So there are, you can watch them, there are players out there who are left-eye dominant and are clearly left-eye dominant uh, if you watch them carefully when they're throwing. So I've named uh, four athletes here. Uh, if you live in Ontario, if you watch Jessica Corrado play, who, who plays for Danielle Inglis, Jessica is very strongly left eye dominant, as am I, and throws from a, a stone position similar to mine. Uh, Lisa Weagle, Weagle is also left eye dominant. Um, for international players, uh, Grant Hardy is left eye dominant. Grant throws a stone similarly to a right-handed person, but if you watch him throw he will turn his head all the way to the left like this and then look at the target through his left eye. That works for him. It doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for lots of other athletes that I know. And then another player is Agnes Nockenhauer who plays for Team Hasselberg and also from her stone position and the way she throws a rock, it's also very easy to tell that she's left eye dominant. And because these players are left eye dominant, they throw the stone differently and they start the stone from a different spot than the classic um, right-handed position that you tend to see um, and from the right-hand position that from the slide I showed you earlier. The key thing is, is that the stone has to be on the line of delivery. So it has, the stone has to be on the line that the player is going to be throwing. So. For me, being a left eye dominant person, I am so strongly left eye dominant that it's almost as if my right eye doesn't exist. So, you know, to put it into perspective for you, on my Honda CRV, I have lane assist like many cars do. I can't use lane assist when I'm on the highway. Lane assist on the Honda puts me way too close to the center line, as far as I'm concerned, because I see everything out of my left eye. So if I try to throw a stone from the classic point underneath the right armpit because I'm right-handed, because I'm left eye dominant, 
it's a very, very strange way to throw because I can be sliding at the broom, but the stone is not underneath my eye. And I have no idea where I'm hitting, if I'm hitting the target or not. And so I've included Rachel here as an example, because like me, um, Rachel is strongly left eye dominant and would much prefer uh, at this time when I was working with her, a stone position where it's much more in front of her body as opposed to being underneath her armpit. The problem for younger athletes is if the stone position is not underneath the armpit, which is the strongest, they might struggle coming out of the hack and making sure that they can keep the stone when they shove it forward and keeping it on the line of delivery. So this is where coaching the athlete in front of you comes in because um, if they if they move the stone underneath their armpit, that's going to solve one problem, but it's going to introduce another one. If they move the stone in front of their body so it's more closely aligned underneath their left eye, it's going to solve that ocular dominance problem, but now they're pushing the stone forward and it's not from a position of strength. So you have to try to find a happy medium, and sometimes this is going to take a lot of work. But the difference for sure is that for younger athletes, and again, especially female athletes, like this, this year I worked with several teams where I'm working with athletes who weigh 40 kilograms. Well, the stone weighs 19. So it's very difficult for them to come out of the hack with any kind of velocity with a stone weighing that much, unless they are gripping the stone and holding it in that place of position underneath their armpit because of an ocular dominance problem. So that's going to take some work. The, the problem tends to go away when you're dealing with, with players with greater mass. So when you're dealing with Trevor Bono, Trevor, I, I do know what his weight is, but I can tell you it's greater than 100 kilograms. And so for Trevor, the weight of the stone is a small percentage in comparison to a 16-year-old female athlete where the stone might be half of her body weight. Okay, so then now that we've done the setup, now we're actually ready to go through the seven steps of the delivery. And just as a reminder, I know all of you have heard this, it, the seven steps are press, rock back, foot back, park, rock forward, foot forward, slide. The, it's the same little saying that we teach in every club coach course. So those are the fundamentals of the of the of the no lift delivery. There's going to be potentially some variability to those seven steps with different athletes. So one of the things that I've done with a couple of my athletes over the years is have them raise their hips before they actually start the backwards motion with the stone. It helps them maintain the line better instead of raising their hips as they bring the rock back. But all in all, that seven step delivery is, you know, the basic fundamentals of the throw. And that's how we, that's how we want younger athletes to throw a rock. One thing I'll mention here is it's very common for younger athletes to omit the park step, which is a problem because it's the park step that invokes the weight shift from the hack foot to the slide foot and then back again. And that's the easiest way when the hack, when the hips are behind the hack for the athlete to generate power for a hit weight shot. And if the athlete does not do the park step, then they're going to have a problem generating hit weight. Okay. So that's the end of part one. Andrea, could we open up the, the, uh, the mics? And mm -hmm. Do yeah. Now, I'm just gonna ask now would be to now would be a really good time if anybody had any particular questions about the fundamentals of the no lift delivery before I move on to looking at the drift and the fishtail. We have one question: How can you tell eye dominance? Ah, okay. So you can you can look up. There's various tests for doing it, and you can look them up if you if you Google ocular dominance. You can find a good article on, on the subject on Wikipedia. But um, in a nutshell, the, the usual test that I do is a test called the Miles test. 
So it works as follows. You take both hands and you form a circle with your hands and you stretch your arms out in front of you. So they're way out in front like this. And then through that hole in your hands, you look at a distant object. So a distant object at the far wall could be the clock at the end of the curling sheet. It, it could be a handle on your kitchen cupboards. Doesn't really matter what it is, but it's at a distant object. And then close your right eye. If your view through the hole completely shifts, that means you are looking through the hole with your right eye, so your right eye dominant. If your view through the hole stays the same, but you've closed your right eye, that means you're looking at the world through your left eye, and so your left eye dominant. So that's called the Miles test. There's a number of other tests to measure ocular dominance. Again, this is all written up on Wikipedia or- Well, you don't sound like, you, like you sound like an ice maker. I said, I know a little bit about making ice. Not a lot, but a little bit. Was but obviously more than you. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> did push him hard about the temperature of the water hitting the ice because Dave Merklinger told me, yeah, the temperature matters when it hits the ice. Okay, um, Andrea, I think it's time to mute. Time to mute. Yes. Okay. Eugene, that's all. You're going to have to um, unmute yourself. How do you want to know? Lynn. Glenn, you'll have to unmute. Yep, yep. gotcha. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So now what I want to do is having gone through the fundamentals of the no lift delivery, I want to talk about two of the common errors that I've, uh, I've seen quite a bit of, a bit of uh, this past season um, at, at U15 and U18 events. So the first one is the drift. So the drift is a situation where the athlete slide path is close to the intended line of delivery, but it's tangential to it. And so the lateral distance away from the actual line of delivery that's desired increases with the leg length of the slide. So they might be you know, fairly close to it at the beginning of their slide, but the further they slide, the more, the more away from the line of delivery they get. So finally, when they get to the near hog line, they might be a foot wide or two feet wide um, from where it is that they really want it to go. And most of the time, drift is to the side of the throwing hand. So if you're a, a right-handed player, most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, the drift is to the right. And if you're a left-handed player, most of the time, the drift is to the left. Oh, we have a couple of questions, Glenn, that may relate back to just the previous part. So okay. in a lefty world, what about setting towards the center in the hack and with the rock placement? So if you're left-handed. Okay, so, so I'm going to guess that the question is based on, you know, doing something like Mark Kennedy, where Mark is the left-hander on the team and is trying to move the stone closer to the line of delivery thrown by his right-handed teammates. Glenn, that question is for me. Okay. With my left team also. Okay. Um, oh, although only Mark and, and uh, Sweeney does it. Uh... Oh, sorry, M Michelle, unmute again, please. I'm sorry. So okay. the, the righties onto those teams have moved towards the center. I mean, this is the uh, Martin uh, and Botcher, um, ex not explanation, but uh, uh, techniques where they're saying, well, the righty and the lefty have to actually start on the same position for the rock placement so that the line of delivery from a righty to a lefty might not change. And so and everything for interns and outturns, is not changing either, so that the angle of attack for the line of delivery is the same. <clears throat> so, actually, I had two questions on that one. There, there was one previous one where, would you consider actually changing the delivery end based on MF field dominance, since um, and the end dominance might not be as important in, in curling? Um, but that's another story. Um, 
so so what is your opinion on on the fact that we're now having from coming from the west both lefties and righties trying to get, start from the center line so that you have the same angle of attack for interns and outturns and for lefties and righties so so michelle in a in a in a nutshell i'm not against that idea as long as we're dealing with experienced competent players i would not attempt to do such a thing with a u15 or u18 athlete where from from where i sit i'm much more interested in consistency for each individual athlete than i'm worried about um, whether or not their deliveries match their teammates thanks ben okay had a hunch i was going to get a question like that uh one more yeah. um should the throwing arm be in front of the knee and set up so that's a great so that's a great question so the the stone has to be in the spot so that it's on the line of delivery and it's on the line of delivery on the line of delivery sorry through the throw so it may be that when the athlete is in the setup position in the hack and in the full squat their knee is in the way but that's okay because as soon as they raise their hips the knee is now no longer going to be in the way and as they go through all of the other um, steps of the delivery everything will occur as normal so this is one of those situations where if you have an athlete who for example has really long legs um, and relatively shorter arms so that the knee is actually in the way when they're in the setup. One of the things that you might do is have them position the stone so that it's in the right spot for them on the line of delivery. And then as the first step in their delivery, rather than move the stone back, they raise the hips first. That gets the knee out of the way. And then they can use the, then they can grip the stone normally and start their backwards motion. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So back to drift. So again, it's a it's a it's a it's a slide, but the the player instead of sliding down the line of delivery is sliding at an angle to it. And the further they slide, the further away they are getting from the from the line of delivery. So in my experience in doing coaching for 20 years. The, the causes of drift are in this order of frequency. So item number one, improper orientation of the hack leg in the setup. Number two, misalignment of hips. Number three, improper motion of the slide foot. Number four, improper placement of the stone. Number five, movement from a flat foot to a toe slide during the delivery. And number six, orthopedic issues with the athlete. And I'll say again, you don't tend to find too many athletes out there that do have orthopedic issues. But this year on just two teams, I dealt with three. So it does happen. And it is something that you have to be aware of. One more question. Should yep. the athlete be changing the rock start position for any shots or always in the same spot? Sometimes wide interns for, for righties, the rock has moved over. Uh, no, it should not be moved. We are, we are looking for consistency. So essentially, regardless of where the target broom is, the athlete needs to face that broom and be square to the broom. And if they move and are square to the broom and face the broom, then the stone is gonna move with them. And from one extreme side of the sheet to the other, the stone is gonna move laterally around the center line about three inches. So on if I'm a right-handed player and I'm throwing to the right-hand side of the sheet, 
given my particular stone position, if now the target broom becomes, you know, edge of the 12 foot on the T line at the other side of the sheet, if I turn to face the broom, my stone is going to move left about three inches. So the, the stone does not stay in a fixed position with every throw. The stone moves with the athlete, um, depending on exactly where the target is. So think of, um, think of the hack as the apex of a triangle where the other ends of the triangle are on the T line at the far end. And the player has to move their body to suit the target. But because the stone is slightly ahead of the hack, the stone is gonna move just ever so slightly in front of them to be in the right position regardless of the line of delivery. And so from one extreme to the other, the stone for most players is gonna move about three inches, maybe two and a half. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each one of these in detail. So improper orientation of the hack leg. So here I've got my son, Ryan, and he's got his ankle twisted in the hack. So his, his toe is pointed to the right. And that forces his hack leg to be also pointed to the right. And so if he starts his forward motion from this point, he's going to be sliding to the right of the intended target. So he's going to be drifting right. Okay, so that's a surefire way of um, missing the target. So if the athlete sets up in this position, then in order to hit the broom, they're going to have to fix their forward motion in some way. And that fix comes in all shapes and sizes. But the usual fix is the athlete basically flops their knee inwards and tries to make sure in the flop that once they do that flop, that the femur is now pointing at the target. And the problem with the fix is the fix is a lot harder to do with hit weight velocities than it is at draw weight velocities. So you might, the athlete might be able to fix it with draw weight. But if they're trying to throw normal hit weight, the fix won't be accurate. And then the second problem is the fix might be overcompensated. And instead of actually sliding wide right, the athlete might in fact be sliding left. An important point here, Glenn, mm -hmm. please tell Ryan I like his pants. <laughs> Those will okay. keep me awake. <laughs> well, hey, hey Glenn. Andrew, Andrew has the same pair of pants. So oh, I like them. Very they've, nice. They've worn, those, they've worn those pants since they were kids. Perfect. Question, so, Glenn. Well, like to cross the province. Thank you. <laughs> okay, question? Yeah. What would you recommend for someone who can't um, fix their foot due to a sports injury? Ah, there you go. Orthopedic issue. So if they can't do that, then you're kind of forced to deal with the fix, right? If they can't get their hack foot pointing on, pointing on the line of delivery so that their femur is straight at the target, if their femur is always going to be pointed laterally, then what you have to practice is you have to practice that fix, right? That's, that's like, there's no magic bullet here. Like if, if your leg isn't straight at the line of delivery, then the athlete has to fix it on, on the line, right? And it, and you know, it, and you see the same thing with golfers. Not all golfers, you know, have perfectly straight swings. Um, some golfers are known as better ball strikers than others. Um, few golfers swing a club like Jim Furick with his little loop that he makes on top of his backswing. They compensate. And if if an athlete is unable to get into that position, they have to compensate. The issue is that compensation gets harder with higher shot velocities. And, and so that's what you have to practice. Okay. Okay. Hip misalignment. So here, the hack leg is set up properly, but the hips aren't square and the hips aren't square because in this case, placement of the slide foot. So here I've made Ryan get into the, get into the hack and I've made him get his slide foot in a 
into a position that's sort of heel toe, but it's really crowding the hack. And I've also made him um, in a pigeon toed kind of stance. So you can see that his sly foot is actually pointing towards the stone just a little bit. So that's really, really awkward for him. Um, but if you're in this position now, you're, the, the femur is now pointing in the right direction, but the hips are not gonna be square to the line of delivery. And once again, a likely outcome of, out of this is going to be a drift to the right. And again, at higher velocities, it's gonna be harder to fix. And the correction for this one is uh, a correct placement of the slide foot, heel toe, that matches what we want for that athlete. So here I've got a video. So I, I, I've really tried to avoid doing, um, doing much video here on the call because I know that over the internet, the video gets, gets a little choppy and it's not really not that great. But here I've got one particular example so this is uh, an athlete I've been coaching for a few years now. This is Graham Singer. And I'm just going to start the video here just for an instant. There, get it down to there. Okay, so camera is directly behind the left hack where Graham is throwing. So would anybody like to comment on, given his hip position, where do you think the target broom might be at the end of the sheet? Right side. I'm sorry? Right side. If we're right side? looking down the How sheet. How far? How far? Edge of uh, four? Like edge eight? Outside eight foot, I would say. I'm guessing. Outside eight foot? Okay. Any other takers? Edge of eight, edge of inside 12. Okay. We so have a mid mid twelve. Mid twelve. Okay, so out there, right? Okay. Did anyone happen to take a look at his hack foot? Her ankle's kind of twisted. Twisted which way? Looks like he's about to roll under it or over it. His his hack foot's pointing left. Yeah. Yeah. So his hack foot's pointing left, and his hips are pointing right. Let's watch what happens. Yeah. His hack foot is pointing at the broom. Correct. His hack foot is pointing at the broom. Okay. So that's what I mean by hip misalignment. Parts of the body are pointing correctly on the line of delivery, but the hips are not. So he didn't do much of a drift there. He, he, he fixed that, but he did have a slight fishtail. I don't know if you noticed that in his back leg, but he did have a slight fishtail. So that's what I mean about hip misalignment in the hack. So you have to look at all the pieces in order to try to figure out what's going on with the athlete and whether they hit the target or not. Can you play it again? I can, yep. My computer is a little slow. Okay, there we go. So he's now squatted down, so that's the setup. And now here's the throw. Hips are still pointing right, still pointing right. Massive twist to get to the left. Okay. Okay. Improper motion of the slide foot. So this is uh, another um, another way that drift is caused. So there's a couple of different ways for this to happen. Um, so I mentioned here three. So one is, is that in the backwards motion, instead of the slide foot coming straight back on the line of delivery, the slide foot actually goes wide. So the slide foot goes further away from the center of the body. And that means when the athlete brings that slide foot now forward, 
in order to get under in order to get underneath the sternum, the slide foot has to come forward at a greater angle, and that is going to push the athlete wide right. So that's one way. A second is the classic C motion of the slide foot, tucking the slide foot behind the hack and then moving it around again. There's another way to cause the same thing. And then the third way is a slide foot that instead of, instead of going straight through to the target, the athlete moves it forward just a little bit and then instantly moves it laterally underneath their sternum and then moves forward from that point. And that massive lateral motion causes them to drift slightly towards the throwing hand. So I, I, I've seen all three uh, in the past year. So what we want in the, in the no lift delivery is we want the slide foot going straight back on the line of delivery and then going straight forward to the target. The slide foot is going to be on a line of delivery parallel to the stone. Exactly how far away it's going to be depends on where the athlete is holding the rock. If the athlete was holding the rock in the dead center of their body, then the ankle of the slide foot would be dead behind the stone. If they're holding the stone underneath their armpit, armpit, then the stone is going to be slightly to the right of their slide foot. The rock is going to is going to hide most of their slide foot, but the toe is going to be sticking out a little bit. But their ankle is still going to be underneath their sternum if they're if they have good balance. Okay. Um, improper stone placement. So here, what happens is. All too often, what I see, especially from younger athletes, is they place the stone too wide right when they get into the hack. So instead of being underneath their armpit, the stone is underneath their shoulder or even wider. And so because it's not in a position of strength underneath their armpit, when they move the rock forward in the fourth step of the no lift delivery, that stone is going to go right. And if you're that's a 19 kilogram stone. And if you're dealing with an athlete who only weighs 40 kilograms, or 45 or 50 kilograms, that mass moving laterally is going to be very, very difficult to correct. And so wherever that stone is going, the athlete's going to follow and they're going to be going, they're going to be going wide to the right hand side. So, and again, remember with stone placement, ocular dominance does indeed play a role. Um, just a couple of um, comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. And before we go too far, and they go back to the improper motion of the sliding foot. Um, yep. So that can also be from speed of the sliding foot and or a timing issue in general. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and then a question, why bring the foot back? Why not just start in that position with the body square to the target? Ah, so I'm going to talk about that. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But okay. the, reason, the reason that we bring the slide foot back in the delivery is to get the hips behind the hack. And the point to getting the hips behind the hack is so that it provides the athlete with more power to be able to propel the stone forwards. That's why we have the slide foot moving back in the first place. Okay. Is it possible to deliver a stone without moving the slide foot at all and just going forwards? Yes, it is but it's a lot harder to get good velocity out of that position. And there have been athletes over time that do that. Um, I think the best example that I've ever seen over my career is David Nedouin, who played okay. for Randy Furby in the eighties. David Nedouin never raised his hips when he threw and he never brought his slide foot behind his body. He just launched himself forwards. Right. Um, David Nedouin. David Nedouin was a big guy and his legs were the size of trees. And so he never had a problem generating hit weight velocity throwing that way. If, uh, if you're a 16 year old girl and you only weigh 40, 40 kilograms, that's not going to work for you. Um, um, Colleen Jones was another who didn't take her foot back and she played a lot of hits so it's interesting mm -hmm. uh comment here about tracy flurry not taking her foot back she actually starts with her foot she starts with her foot way back way back yeah but she does not move her hips behind the hack no 
but Tracy Fleury does not throw peel. No. And that's why she doesn't throw peel. Okay, any other questions? Not seeing any in the chat. Okay. Okay, uh, transition from flat foot to a toe slide. So here we've got Jill, who I've, um, I coached last year and I'm coaching again this year. So frequently an issue that I see with, uh, with young players is they'll start their slide with a flat foot. And then as soon as they get through to say the near T line, then they'll go up on their toe to slide. And um, many athletes do it to um, try to get um, to try to decelerate less and and keep up their velocity as they're as they're through going through their delivery, um, and the issue is by going up from their flat foot to their toe, that causes when they do that that's a moment of instability, um, and often what I see from athletes when they do that is that's the as soon as they go up on their toe that's the instantaneous cause of a slight drift. And usually the drift is actually to the opposite of the throwing hand instead of, so for a right-handed player, the drift would be going left instead of the drift going right. So in this particular case, you can see that Jill is um, sliding on her toe. So this is something that she does, but again, Jill has orthopedic issues. So this is something that we've just had to work through. Um, I am aware, for, for anyone who's interested, I am aware of um, biomechanic research from the University of Dundee in Scotland that was done a few years ago that indicates in a curling context that the strain on the slide knee at least doubles when sliding on your toe as opposed to sliding flat foot. Are you able to share that re research, Clint? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's for anyone who's interested, you can send me an email. I'll send you the PDF. It's, uh, okay. it's published research, so it's freely available. It's, there's no problem there. Wonderful. So if you have an athlete who is working through these kinds of issues, one of the things that you might consider is something that I did here with uh, Riley, who um, was on my U18 girls team this year. So Riley, again, Riley just turned 17. Riley, um, when I started coaching her last May, was a self-taught tuck slider with chronic knee, knee pain. Um, and I realized very quickly that um, she was going to have a very short career in curling if she kept doing what she was doing. So after a couple of meetings with her and her parents, decided that we were gonna work with trying to get her to move to a flat foot delivery the following season. So this past year, um, and obviously with training from her physiotherapist in order to start working on her knee issues. So what I did through the summer is I had her practice a flat foot slide on a slide board. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with a slide board, it's a piece of vinyl, typically around eight feet long, that's used for training for skiers and other athletes who require side to side movement. Um, but I got this idea from my son, Andrew, because Andrew tore his um, ACL a couple of years ago when he was playing at Western. And this was one of the exercises that the physiotherapists at Western had him do before he could get back to playing on the ice is he had to do um, a certain number of slides in a row, um, dry land before they even let him into the rink to play. So um, anyway, Riley did uh, just amazing with this dry land training through the summer, worked really hard. And um, I'm very, very proud of her because she's one of the best throwers that I've seen out there. She's, you would, if you watched her throw now, you would never know that the year before she was a tuck slider. She's just amazing. So here I've got just a short little video of Riley on the slide board. 
just practicing getting into that position. And that's all she was doing, just trying to trying to get her muscles to uh, get into that slide position with her ankle underneath her sternum, so that by the time we got onto the ice in September, she was already used to the motion. Okay, so I mentioned it, I mentioned it, I know a, a number of times previously, but all I'm going to say it again, ask your athletes about orthopedic issues. Um, I have had the opportunity um, to coach an athlete who's pigeon toed. And that's a real challenge as well. Um, so some of you who are older, like me, remember Don Walchuk, who, uh, who played for Kevin Martin. Yep. And was very pigeon toed, but it never really seemed to bother him. Um, unfortunately, in my experience, having an athlete to, that is pigeon toed is a real issue. Um, there's only so much you can do. Um, but one of the things, one of the things that could make a difference with an athlete who's pigeon toed is changing the shoes. In my experience, different shoes have different characteristics. And if, if the, if the, if the towing in is minor, a change in footwear might actually pay off. Unfortunately, the problem in curling is we, we are not a sport like golf where you can try before you buy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a real problem. So, you know, um, but the athlete I was working with, I got her to borrow some shoes of a similar size and we were able to try some. And we actually did work to eventually a reasonable solution um, so she, that she could slide straight. Um, but in her case, what would happen is that she would, she would slide to the left and the longer she would glide, the further left she would go. So another thing that we did was we changed her release point to try to make sure that she was online, uh, online longer. But so anyway, we have a um, question, Glenn. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. encourage a no-tuck slide, a flat foot slide, or semi-flat foot? I encourage a flat foot slide. Flat foot slide, okay. Flat foot slide. Okay. All right. So that's, that's what I've got for drift. Now what I want to do is finish up the talk and talk about the fishtail. So this is me doing a fishtail at mm -hmm. Mississauga Gulf and Country. You're very good uh, at it. It took some doing. <laughs> it's not something that I'm used to, um, especially, especially with my hip issues, but I couldn't get any of my players to actually do it. They all refused. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I guess I'll try to do one for the camera myself. So essentially, the, the, a fishtail is not in itself a problem. It's a symptom of a problem. And, this, and it's a symptom of hip misalignment. So the body is going in one direction. And by and large, the hips want to be 90 degrees to that direction. And if they're not, then some sort of fishtail is likely going to happen. The usual one, what I call the common fishtail going forward, is where, as you can see in the picture with me, for a right-handed player, the hack leg, which is my right leg, is coming across my body behind me and swinging to the left of the sheet. And the reason that my leg is doing that is because it's what my, what, the motion is trying to align my hips to straighten them out so that my hips are 90 degrees um, perpendicular to where I'm going. However, it's absolutely possible for a fishtail to occur the opposite way, where if you're a right-handed player, the right leg would actually swing out to the right side of the sheet. And there's actually a really good example of this on YouTube if you go to uh, YouTube and you watch the replay of the Champions Cup final for the Grand Slam of curling that was just held a couple of weeks ago and watch Brendan Botcher in the eighth end, you'll see both of his shots in the eighth end with a fishtail where his right leg swings outwards instead of inwards. And for his first rock, it was bad enough that he missed his shot badly and almost lost that game because of it. We have a question about fishtailing. Did you test hip abductors strength in fishtailers? 
because the hips, uh, hip level does not stay level? Uh, no, and I, uh, I'm not a biomechanist like Michelle, so I don't know, I, I wouldn't know even how to do that. Right, that would be a tough thing to test. Yeah. Did Michelle ask that question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got it in one. <laughs> the, the reason why I'm asking that question, Glenn, is actually I've seen that in my girls when they're um, if they have hip abductors, uh, abductors um, weaknesses, they cannot maintain the force of and the pelvis drops onto the other side, which then the leg in the back goes goes towards the side that's away from where it's dropping, which looks like a fish tail. Um, and, and when we start strengthening those hip ab abductors, so which basically uh, gets the leg out, so an, exer an exercise is those bands where you're, you're yeah. opening up your legs, yeah. um, they were able to maintain the force necessary to stay straight. Interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. That's, that's really good. Thanks, Michelle, for that. So, so Michelle, it's a clamshell, right? Clamshell with a, with the band. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so my experience with fishtail is, is usually the root cause is hip misalignment in the hack. And then the athlete, what they're doing with the fishtail is trying to fix that misalignment as they do their forward slide. So for the usual fishtail that happens 95% of the time, the hips aren't square to the line of delivery and the left hip is slightly behind. If you think about it, the left hip is slightly behind the right. So if the leg moves around, what you're trying, what the athlete's trying to do is move their left foot forward or conversely move their right foot slightly back so that their hips are going to be 90 degrees to the line of delivery. And by doing that, their hack leg is going to swing out to the left behind them. And of course, with a left-handed player, it's the opposite. So for me, in my experience in coaching, the root, the common root causes are three. One is improper setup in, setup in the hack, causing the hips to be twisted when you start. Number two, failure to keep the hip square during the backwards motion. So you can be set up fine when you begin the delivery, but when the athlete does their backwards motion, they move their hips as they're doing it. And that causes the misalignment and that misalignment carries forward to their forward motion. And then number three is that dastardly C movement of that slide foot that we always try to coach against. And because of the C, what ends up happening is the athlete does the C with their foot, but when they bring the foot forward, they don't bring the hip up along with it to make sure that the hips stay square. And now the left hip stays behind if you're a right-handed player. And again, the hips are misaligned and because the left hip is behind, a fishtail results. So um, here's Ryan again with um, uh, the Yay, classic Ryan. case of uh, slide foots in the improper position for him. It's not heel toe. His hips are twisted to the left. So what's going to happen is when he starts his forward motion, his his because his hips are twisted left, his left hip is now behind where it needs to be, and he's going to come through in a forward motion, and his right foot is going to swing around and come to the left to try to square himself out. Um, so the correction here is as simple as simply putting the slide foot in the right spot. And then magically, a whole bunch of issues can vanish once the slide foot is in the right position. Uh, we have a comment. Um, yep. Glenn, would you ask TSN to stop showing Mark Kennedy's C delivery? <laughs> <laughs> or, or Jennifer Jones or... Yeah. <clears throat> or yeah lots of others i mean sure like you see lots of things on the ice with tour players that you never would dream of coaching with a young athlete right many of them are very bad habits 
like Brendan Botcher missing those two shots in the eighth end of the Champions Cup. It's entirely his setup and it's entirely fixable. And I don't know why he continues to throw that way. Um, Jennifer Jones constantly does that C delivery. She's used to it. I mean, I can't argue with the fact that she's won as much as she had, but we're not going to teach a C deliver a, a C slide foot motion to a 16 year old. We're not going to do that. No. Right. You have to want to change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's that one. Okay. Failure to keep, keep the hip square. So here's what happens. The setup can be great. So the curler is squatted in the hack. Hack leg femur is pointing to the target. Slide leg femur is parallel to the hack leg. Slide foot is in the right position. Hips are square. Hips are level. Their back is straight. Stone is in the right place. Everything's perfect. And then they start their backward motion and they get to the park step and they pivot their hips. So instead of going backwards, keeping the hips square and then carrying forwards, they get to the park step and then they twist their hips to the side. And usually it's to the side away from the slide foot. And now that their hips are twisted, now when they start their forward motion, their hips are no longer square. And so then what you're going to see when they go through their forward motion and they bottom out and then begin the slide, once they get to the near T line, you're going to see a fishtail. So the issue is trying to prevent that misalignment when they're going through the backward motion. And a diagnostic technique that you can use is what we mentioned about 30 minutes ago with David Nedowin, eliminate all of the backward motion from the throw. So the athlete is set up. They do hips, they elevate their hips, which hopefully should not do anything to them keeping square, and then simply starting the forward motion. And if they slide on target, then you know their setup is great. That's not the issue. If you reintroduce the backward motion and you see the fishtail again, then that's a really good indicator that what's happening is it's during the backwards motion that they're pivoting their hips. And now their hips are going to be in misalignment when they start the forward motion. So breaking the delivery down into pieces can help a lot in trying to diagnose where the where the error is actually happening. But sometimes the setup is actually great and it, and the hips become misaligned through the delivery, not from the beginning. And then finally, um, slide foot placement and movement of the slide foot. So again, um, improper slide foot movement, either bringing it back, not on the line to delivery or doing the C, um, all kinds of things can happen with the forward motion. And if that slide foot causes the misalignment of the hips, then the result that you're gonna see is gonna be a fishtail. So fixing that slide foot is usually the first thing I look for. And then if it's not that, and I think the slide foot in the setup is good, then the next thing I look for is his hip misalignment during the backwards motion and then see if that fixes it. But with these couple of things, I've been really, really successful at curing um, fishtails uh, out of athletes. Okay, so um, just to finish up, so I'm a big believer in fundamentals. I think that more than anything, we should be coaching the fundamentals that are in the coaching manuals to younger players. There are good and proper reasons for all of those things to be documented. Um, but at the same time, all of that write-up in those coaching manuals is not dogma. You, you have to be able to coach the athlete in front of you. So if an athlete has an orthopedic issue, or if an athlete's physiology is considerably different than what it is that you're expecting, right? They have long arms, they have long legs, they're the size of Trevor Bono, like whatever it is, then you have to work with that. Um, the other thing is, is that competitive breakdown happens with all players. So you can work in practice and, and get uh, 
a solid practice delivery. And then after a month, after the athletes gone through playing two events, you bring them back to practice and then you start to see idiosyncrasies in their delivery. Happens all the time, happens to everybody. But the only thing that's going to fix it is technical work and practice. Fixing it will not happen playing more games. So um, that brings up a question that was asked. How do you handle issues with delivery during an event? Ah, oh, gee, if I had a nickel for every time I had to face such a such an issue. Mm -hmm. you, do, you do the best you can do. Like often, especially with younger players, I'm not simply watching the game, watching the strategy. I'm looking for technical issues with players, especially if they start missing. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's one thing that I can that I can give to an athlete you know, at the fourth or fifth end break or at a timeout to say, I think you're doing this, try this and see if it's better. And maybe that will improve your throwing for the rest of the game. And then once they do that, then they're solid the rest of the way. And then sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes I've made it worse. And then you're going back to, okay, so we're going to try something else in, you know, pre-event practice for the next game and try to figure it out. But I, 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 what I try to do is I try to be helpful as opposed to, you know, letting them sink. Right. Um, Cause if, if they get no feedback, they're going to keep doing what they're doing because yeah. they, they don't know enough to fix it themselves. And usually the, the teammate who is going to be able to help them is the skip because the skip is actually looking at them when they're delivering the stone, except the skip is too far away to be able to give them any valid feedback because she can't see from that far away. Right. I'm also a really strong believer with younger athletes in achieving consistency. So we, you know, we had that discussion um, with Michelle about, you know, changing where you start the stone. And I'm going, you know, we've got enough issues with trying to get players to throw consistently well, then making the job even harder by dinking around with you know, particular techniques and where they're starting their stone from and trying to match their team teammates and whatever. That's really hard. Um, it's hard enough working with an athlete, for example, whose ocular dominance isn't, um, who isn't matching their hand. Like I've, I've worked with my, you know, people like myself who are right-handed and left eye dominant. I've also had to work with left handed players who are right eye dominant and they have the opposite problem. And it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. I think it's I think it I think it does the athletes a disservice, frankly, to in addition to all of those issues and, and worrying about consistency, to lay it on them some more and get them to change and modify their deliveries so that it it more closely matches their other teammates. I think that's really hard. And and that's not something you know I would recommend. And and Maybe for those of you, you've got, you know, some questions about, well, how much could ocular dominance really matter? Because ocular dominance is, is to a degree, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, true or false. It's not binary. Like there's degrees of ocular dominance. Some people have more um, binocular vision than other people do. I am greatly affected by ocular dominance, other people less so. But just as an experiment, if you want to try it, Next time you're at the pool hall, you're at a, you know, at, you're over for dinner somewhere and your friends have a snooker table like I do behind me. If you're right-handed and you're holding the cue in your right hand, try to make a shot with your right eye closed. Just try it and see how hard it is. And some of you are going to say, well, that's really not, that's not a valid example because if I close one eye, well, then I don't have binocular any vision anymore. And, you know, with, you're comparing apples and oranges. I get that. I understand that. But it's really hard if you're right eye dominant and you're right handed to all of a sudden close your right eye and be accurate. It's really hard. And this is what we're asking our curlers to do if they're if they're opposite eye dominant. It's it's difficult. Uh, question. Do you recommend using the same position for the hack foot every time? I've seen the tip of the foot shoe move higher for takeouts and lower for draws. I was wondering if I was going to get that question. Uh, I do not recommend moving the slide foot down for draw, draw weight shots. 
And the reason I don't is because I think it causes more problems than it solves. The, the slide foot position, the alignment in the hack, the leveling of the hips, that's all predicated on a slide foot position that matches the elevation of the hack foot in the hack. If you change the elevation of the hack foot in the hack by moving it down so now the toe is touching the ice surface, the athlete has to change their slide foot position in order to stay square. And if they don't, they're likely going to miss. We don't need to do that. There's other ways of generating less velocity out of the hack than moving the hack foot down. So I would keep it consistent and you do exactly the same motion and the same setup for every delivery. If you're, if you're Mark Kennedy and you're a tour player and you've won a bunch of world championships and you wanna dicker around with your delivery, great, go for it. But if I'm coaching a U16 girls team, I'm not doing that, just not. Um, we're getting into some other questions that I might, I think might be better for another webinar, um, okay. Glenn. So I'm just wondering how you want to handle it. Um, if well, if there, if, there are, if there are other questions that are off topic, if people want to send me an email and they want my opinion, then okay. they can, they can do that. Yeah. I'm going on vacation though, in a couple of days. So I might not get back to you for a while, but if you, but if you have as, questions, you want to as send long me. as you get back to people before the ice goes in, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Andrea, can we have this email address again? Yes, I'll, yes. I'll, when I'll, I when I'll, I I'll bring, it's on my last slide, which I'm just about to get to. So I'll bring oh, okay, it. okay, Perfect. thank you. Thanks, yeah. Bertha. Okay, so I I hope you've gotten the idea that I think fundamentals are really important, and it's what we want to do is we want to want to minimize the fixing that athletes are doing in order to make sure that they're more consistent when they throw. And just to put, again, put, to put that into perspective, like historically, the championship, championship team at U21 Nationals averages at least an 80% shooting percentage. So just think about that for a minute. You get 20 stones per game, assuming you don't go into an extra end. So if you're shooting 80%, 16 of those stones have to be perfect if you have four misses perfect. So, okay. So maybe you don't have four zeros. Maybe you have two zeros. Well, it still means that you got to be a really good thrower with all the rest of your shots in order to make up that 80% shooting percentage. That's, that's going to be good enough to get you into the final. And the more consistent that we can make athletes, the better chances they're going to have at doing that and getting better consistency means paying attention to the fundamentals. So one of the drills that I use in practice every week with the teams that I coach is the gauntlet drill, looking for issues with alignment and release, looking for that consistency and, and throwing at different speeds. And the gauntlet drill webinar is available on the OCC archived uh, webinars. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. And then lastly, coach the athlete that's in front of you. Um, you're going to learn at least as much about a player's delivery standing behind them as you are from the front. Standing behind is where you're gonna witness things like their hack foot position, whether or not their hips are level, whether or not their back is straight, um, whether what they do with their slide foot when they're, when they're going through the backwards motion, whether or not they're misaligning their hips when they get to the park step. Those are the things you're gonna see from the back very few of those things can you identify from the front. So when you're coaching an athlete and you're working on delivery problems, walk all the way around. And video is a video is a great thing, but even good video resolution still can't tell you about really finer points like timing issues or you know what an athlete is doing with a body part that you can't see. Um, so you have to do the walk around. Okay, second last slide, just like to acknowledge a couple of people. Um, Bill, who's written a lot about delivery, but person I want to thank the most is my mentor coach, Gary Crosley, who brought me into coaching 20 years ago. Um, Gary was the head coach at Laurier, 
for many years. He's retired now. Um, Gary's forgotten more about coaching than I've ever learned. Um, and he's taught me everything about delivery fundamentals and diagnosis and correction of, of delivery. So my, my thanks as always to Gary. And then I'd like to thank all the athletes that I have um, savagely included in this, in this <laughs> slide deck, uh, especially my son, Ryan, who I, I made contort his body in lots of different ways in order to pose for the camera. So Ryan, Riley, Amanda, Graham, Jessica, Jillian, Rachel, Evie, um, Emma, and of course, uh, Trevor and Oyasun as well. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Happy I didn't have to compete with the leaps tonight. If you want to send me an email, uh, that's my email address. You can find me on Twitter at gpauly. Um, and if you have questions, um, fire away. Um, Andrea, do you want to open the mics now or what do you want to do? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we will ask all to unmute. One thing I would just like to add is if you're sending questions to Glenn, if you think of it, would you please copy me on the email and, and then I will compile, try to do it as soon as possible, although I recognize that Glenn's going on holidays. What a guy. Um, and, and so in July, or when Glenn's back and has had a chance to answer the emails, Glenn will copy me as well, hopefully on, on his responses. I'll That's compile right. them and, uh, and share them with everybody. So everybody has the same information. Um, are there any other uh, questions? And, and please keep your questions related to this uh, presentation to the setup portion of the delivery. Um, yeah, I'm not, release, not doing, rotation. Not doing brushing, yeah, not doing brushing questions tonight. No, I, I did not on purpose talk about release. And frankly, if you want to, if you want to talk to anybody about release, the best coach I know of in Ontario for release is Morris Wilson. If yeah. you, you've got a question about releases, talk to Morris. He is the best. So and maybe there's an, there's lots, a, lots there's an idea for, for another webinar. Yes, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can get Morris on on and and have him do a webinar about releases. There was Morris a cat is... that just walked across the screen. <laughs> so good suggestion. So, um, it, do you have? If anybody has questions related to this presentation, not moving into any other areas, uh, any questions at the moment? Okay, I hear crickets. Uh, no, Scott here. Okay, Scott. Uh, Glenn, at the beginning, you had talked about uh, having the rock in the armpit instead of in front of the knee, in front of the toe. Yep. Isn't the armpit the old way and in front of the toe the new way? So that when you pulse, uh, do your press, drop your knee up, straight back, straight forward. Instead of coming from the side in the armpit, I think you're going to find that those two points are actually the same in most cases. Um, the The issue is the having the handle underneath the armpit is the position where the the athlete is strongest and is able to propel the stone forward with the least likelihood of imposing a lateral motion on the rock. Typically that lateral motion is going to be wide right. The rock is going to get away from them. Rarely do I see that stone going left. Um, if they, if you put a laser on the middle of the stone when they're in that position, and then you have them, um, and you have the laser on the middle of the rock, and then you have them back away entirely from the hack and you move the stone, take a look where your laser light ends up being. And the laser light will likely be on, on the block of the hack and probably exactly where their small toe is for many people. But the difference is, like consider, consider the two players that I mentioned previously. So you've got Riley, um, who just turned 17, or I forget exactly how tall she is, but Riley might be five foot one, um, tiny girl. Shoulders are this wide. 
And then you've got Trevor Bono. Trevor is at least 6'6". Six, six. Not sure exactly how tall he is, but he's tall. He's tall. I know, I know how much he weighs. I don't know what his suit size is. I'm going to say it's at least a 52. At least. I mean, I'm a 40. He dwarfs me. Like, I am a small person compared to him. So for Trevor, putting that stone underneath his armpit is going to be quite a further distance away from his hack foot than it would be for Riley. Right? So the stone position, the stone position has to suit the athlete and the stone position has to pay attention to two things. Where is the athlete the strongest so that they propel the stone forward with the least amount of likelihood of a lateral motion applied to the rock? And number two, ocular dominance plays a role and maybe that's not the right position for how they need to see when they're actually throwing in order to hit the target. Those are the variables that you have to play with. But isn't ocular dominance cut down immensely if the rock is directly in front of you versus off to the side? Uh, no, it's different. It's not the same. It is not in the same position. Trust me, as an opposite eye dominant player, it is not the same. It is not. No, it's not the same, but it cuts down the amount of move, movement there is. Mm, in my experience coaching young women, having a stone position that differs from the stone being underneath the armpit is a problem with lateral motion. Almost universally. Okay. Um, uh, have you ever taught any of the sliders when they've stopped sliding and how to stand up properly so they don't have so many knee problems? No. Everybody stands up on their slider, which is an incredible amount of torque on their knee. If you get your gripper foot underneath you and then stand up, there's an immense amount of less pressure on the knee. Okay. As a, as a lay person, I'm going to argue that I'm not sure that I see that much of a difference, but I'm going to leave it to a professional like Michelle, who's a biomechanist to tell me one way or the other. And, and I think we're getting right. a little outside the, um, the uh, presentation. Yeah. Thanks for any, your input. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, I, um, this is Bruce. This is Bruce. Go I've ahead. got one. I've got one question. In the beginning, you mentioned about placing the foot in the hack about a centimeter off center to the left or to the right. Could you explain that reasoning behind it? Sure. So the surface of the hack, surface of a Marco hack is concave. It's not flat like blocks in track and field. The reason that the blocks and track and field are straight is because the athlete is going in a straight line directly in front of the blocks. But that's not true in curling. The hacks are fixed, but the slide target varies from one edge of the sheet to the other. So rather than line up with the hack foot in the middle of the hack for every target, one can move the hack foot slightly to the opposite side of center depending where exactly it is that they want to go. But that movement of the hack foot is going to be minute. It might be half a centimeter max. And that's just to use the concave surface of the Marco hack to your advantage so that you can get a better grip. So if you're sliding to the left of center, out to the way outside of the 12, your, your foot would then be to the right of center in the hack. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Bertha, you had a question? Well, it's not a question, it's, it's my philosophy. I feel that the toe sliding is a timing issue. 
I think if you're sitting up straight in the hack and you pull your rock back and you bring your foot back and as you come forward with your sliding rock, you bring your, your sliding foot forward, it will come underneath your chest, will, which will promote a flat foot slide. Now, if you're in the hack and you're leaning way forward and your rock is way out front and you try to come back and you, and you come back and your sliding foot comes in behind, it will come under your hips because you're so far forward, which will promote a toe slide. So as far as I'm concerned, the timing thing is an issue with toe sliding. It's all to do with timing. So, um, so I'm not going to say you're. I'm not going to say you're wrong. Um, the example that I was giving, though, is different than what you just stated. My example is the athlete starts with the setup for a flat foot slide, and actually moves out of the hack starting their forward motion in a flat foot slide but once they yep. get to the near once they get to the near t line then they move up on their toe but if their foot is under their chest they might not need to come up onto their toe i realize that but they're but that's what they're doing and oh okay and because they're doing it they're having delivery they're they're having line of delivery issues because yeah. going up on their toe causes a drift yeah, I've and just so, found that my, so fix, especially my the fix, is, is, the fix is to simply flat foot slide and not go up on yeah. the Yeah, yeah, I've noticed with my boys that are, I've got a couple of boys that are really tall and they lean way forward and they have their rock way out front. And when they come up and they come back, their sliding foot is under their hips, which yep. makes them come up on their toe. Yep, yep, correct. That's what will happen. Thank you, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? All right, um, I would like to thank Glenn very much. It's been, it, it really has been interesting. It's a good refresher for everybody. It's an in-depth refresher and um, we're all gonna take something away from this. I especially liked watching Glenn throwing badly and Ryan <laughs> setting up badly. That's always kind of fun and interesting because we know that they all, that they both are very good at what they do. As I said earlier, please send questions to Glenn, but copy me. Um, I will be sending out the recording and a link to the recording and a link to the slide deck. And so you'll have both Glenn's email and my email. If you send your questions to Glenn and copy me, and then Glenn will do the same in his responses, I will compile everything and um, get send them out to everybody once we've, uh, Glenn has had time after he's languishing on a beach someplace maybe. No, or, I'm, going to, I'm going to Italy, I'm not going to any beach. Oh, he'll be languishing in a vineyard then. Yeah. Um, enjoying Italian cuisine, which is Glenn's specialty. Um, lastly, I would just like to say when I do send the link and the links to the slide deck and to the recording, please remember that these are for your personal use only. Uh, they're not to be shared beyond your team or people that you are, are athletes that you are working with. Okay, Glenn's worked a lot, very hard on this and, and put a lot of thought into it. So we want to make sure that he receives appropriate recognition. So thank you, everybody. The next um, webinar is on June the 6th with uh, Steph Thompson, and it's going to be about uh, conditioning for U15 to U18 athletes. There's she and I have talked about it, and there's some interesting information. If you haven't already registered, please go to the OCC website and register as soon as you can. Andrea, will you be doing the invite? On June the 6th? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. All righty. Thank you, everybody. Have thanks, a everyone for, thank you. thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank Appreciate yep. it. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll see everybody on June the 6th, I hope. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Glenn. You're welcome, Andrea. My pleasure.